All right, grab your Bibles. I have no time to preach, which is so sad. So, you'll stick around. It's just the other people that are coming that we have to get out of here for, which is why we need a building, amen? We can go to one service, and I can preach as long as I want to. And you're going to have to listen. So, <laughs> This weekend um, is Sanctity of Life Weekend. And i got to be honest, Friday night, I was preparing to preach on something completely different. And then the Lord struck my heart with, with something. And I, I really felt like the Lord wanted me to speak on the sanctity of life this weekend. It is sanctity of life weekend. And then I felt, after I went in that direction, then I felt spiritual opposition, which means two things. Number one, this is going to be good. Number two, you need to hear this. And people need to hear this. By the way, um, we support a ministry in town called the Resource Center. Um, they are a resource for um, women who uh, find themselves um, find themselves find themselves pregnant. However, that could possibly happen. Uh, people in crisis, you know, uh, in need, or they don't have to necessarily. It doesn't necessarily have to be an unwanted pregnancy. Maybe it's a wanted pregnancy, but there's they need additional resources. They also do um, STD testing for men and women, that kind of stuff. Um, and there are flyers in our foyer. And if you want to grab one of those, I think we got out here. This is a ministry, a uh, local ministry that we are proud to support, and they're doing great things. So um, that's out here in the foyer. Um, but here's the deal: we at uh, City Light Church, we are unapologetically pro-life. Amen? Unapologetically pro-life. Now, um, I would say a fifth of being pro-life is something analogous to legislation. So a lot of times when people think, oh, you're pro-life, oh, that's a political thing. Part of it is a political thing. Being pro-life is much more than a political agenda. I want to say this before I go any further. I want to stress that if you have had an abortion or if you've ever encouraged a woman that you um, are with to get an abortion, I want to stress that um, this message is in no way or should ever be um, made to condemn you. If you feel condemnation, it is in no way me condemning you. It is the accuser of the brethren or perhaps your own heart. Um, but God has abundant grace for every single person. We all need God's abundant grace. If you're like me, and I'm sure you are in this respect, there are things in life you wish you hadn't done. And there are things in life you wish you had done that you should have done. Amen? And so there's absolutely no condemnation in this place. Um, Jesus said in Luke 23, 34, when he was being crucified on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Many people have not understood the repercussions of what they were doing, didn't know what they were doing, they were scared. And in a room this size, undoubtedly, many people have been impacted by this, and there's absolutely no condemnation. However, I just want to say that we are unapologetically pro-life, and I believe this is a stand that the church can and should make. I have three goals here in these short few moments. Number one, if you are pro-life and actively engaged in making a stand, I want to encourage you to stay engaged and let you know that you're not alone. This pastor and this church is with you. Number two, if you are pro-life, but it's not a high priority on your list, I want to encourage you to move this up on your list of priorities of things to be actively engaged in and pray for in our world. Number three, if you are not pro-life, I want to make an appealing case to you today to perhaps change your mind. So if you would afford me the opportunity to do that, I would, I would appreciate that. Christians historically have been pro-life, going all the way back to even the very early church. And why, and why are Christians pro-life? Well, because of the Bible, because of scriptures that, that talk about the value and the sanctity of human life. That's why Christians are pro-life. But going all the way back to the early church, you know, in the, the Greco-Roman culture, if a baby was unwanted or deformed or those kind of things, oftentimes those babies would be discarded. They would expose them to the elements. They would drown them. They would, I mean, the value for life wasn't extremely high. But Christians historically have been rescuers of those babies because we understand the sanctity of of life. There's three central questions I want to address today. Some of this I have talked about before in sermons. Some of this will be new. The three central questions. Number one, is an unborn baby human? Or is it becoming human? Is it becoming human or is it human? Amen. Thank you. Does an unborn baby have value or is it becoming valuable? 
It is valuable. Come on. Should an un- unborn baby have rights? Some rights? All rights. Come on. Those are the questions. Here's what the Bible. Now let's go to the Bible. So I'm, I'm, this is, I'm a pastor. This is what I do. I go to the Bible. How many of you know if you're going to church and the pastor doesn't go to the Bible, don't go to that church. <laughs> okay. You, you shouldn't really give a rip what I say. It really matters what the Word says. And I'm only doing a job when I preach the Word. So <clears throat> if I have an opinion, I'll try to say this is my opinion. You can take it or leave it. But if it's the Word of God, we have to deal with it. Amen. The Bible says that we are intricately and methodically made in the womb by God. The declaration is that the unborn have tremendous value in his sight. Psalm 133, 13 through 15. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. This is King David declaring about being fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image. I believe one of the reasons why historically culture has had an issue with valuing the sanctity of human life is because this, this uh, intricacy of being woven in the womb is happening in the seclusion of the womb, out of sight, out of mind. However... Technology has made it possible for us to have ultrasounds and these kind of things. And m- most of the time, when a woman can see the ultrasound of what's growing and developing in a heartbeat of what's happening inside her, mo- many, many times, they change, if they were planning on getting an abortion, many times they change their minds and choose life. A very high percent. Verse 16, you saw me before, everyone say before. Before I was born, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before, everyone say before, before a single day passed, okay? This, this infers that the, there wasn't, they're not becoming valuable, they are value, valuable. They're not becoming human, they are human. They, they, they shouldn't have some rights, they should have full rights. Verse 16, I'm sorry, uh, let's, let's jump down the verse. Let's jump way back in the Bible to Job, actually. You're going to jump way back, yeah. Yeah. Um, God has a plan for his destiny for every baby prior to being born. Job chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, it says this. He, he says, you clothe me with skin and flesh. You knit my bones and sinews together. Again, this, this idea of God doing this intricate work. You gave me life. Everyone say life. And showed me your unfailing love. Everyone say love. My life was preserved by your care. Okay, notice life and God's love being given simultaneously. It isn't as though God gives life and then, like, later on, I'll I'll come back and love you later. No, life and love happening at the same time. Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Notice, before he was in the womb, the Lord says, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. In other words, there was a work of grace happening inside of the womb. I want to just encourage you, mothers who were pregnant, dads who are are fathers to be, pray for the babies in your wife's womb. And mamas, pray for those babies in the womb because there can be a work of grace and sanctity. Like, before they come out, pray that they have straight teeth so they don't have to get braces later on in life. Amen? Save you thousands of dollars. And maybe you don't have the faith when their teeth are all, you know, crooked and snaggle tooth. But maybe before they even have teeth, you have the faith that their teeth will be straight. Amen? Work of sanctification in the womb right there. One more scripture here. Zechariah. Um, in, in Luke chapter 1, we're going to read 11 to 15. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. It says this, Zechariah, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So Zechariah went to the temple to, to serve as priest in the temple, and the Lord appeared to him. Verse 12, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear, and so would you. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bury son, and you are to call him John. 
He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, the whole Nazarite thing there you can study on, but, um, and he, watch this, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Everyone say before. Filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. What does this mean? This means that babies can have giftings and callings and, and a work of grace and sanctification in the womb and can even be filled with the Holy Spirit. Their bodies are developing, their minds are developing, but their spirit is developed. Now let's jump down to verse 39. This is also the story where Mary, the mother of our Lord, has a, had a visitation from the archangel Gabriel. When she was told she would conceive and, and, and give birth to Jesus, she heads over to uh, visit her relative, um, Elizabeth. He says this, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried down to the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then watch this, she's going to prophesy now. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt, watch this, for joy. Everyone say joy. Baby in her womb, leaping for joy. What is joy? Joy is an emotion. Babies in the womb can experience emotion, feelings, pain, suck their thumbs, like there's a lot going on there. Notice the baby's experience joy of only six months long and sensitive to the spirit realm. According to the Bible, we can carry giftings, uh, callings, and purpose in the womb. And apparently those giftings and callings can even be ignited within the womb. So are unborn babies human or are they becoming human? They're human. If you took the DNA of a baby in utero and, and, and did a test, what is this species? It would be the same as if you took DNA from an 80-year-old. You would determine, oh, this is, this is a human. This is a human. There would be no difference. Are they becoming human or are they human? They're human. Do one more babies have value or, or, or are they becoming valuable? They are becoming or they are valuable. I wanted to make a list. Here's a list of all things that are human. These are all human. And they're different titles given to different developmental stages of life. Zygote, embryo, fetus, infant, toddler, child, pre-adolescent, adolescent, young adult, middle adult, old adult, and geriatric. Can I get a witness from the geriatrics? Every stage, yeah, every one of those stages, there's stages of development. They're not, one isn't human and the other not human. One isn't valuable and the other are not valuable. They're, they all have value in God. They're all human, all spirit beings, and all valuable in God's sight. This is what the Bible teaches, if you care to know what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible teaches. Amen? Okay. I am going to jump ahead in my notes. Here's what I'll say. Regardless of size, level of development, level of dependence, or location, people are valuable, people are human, and should have rights. Do, should tall people have more rights than short people? I hope not. I'm not an extremely tall person. Imagine that. If the tallest people had more rights, you know. Level of development. Should sixth graders have more rights than third graders? Perhaps more privileges or responsibilities, but not more rights. Level of dependence. Should people in wheelchairs have less rights than people who are not in wheelchairs? Okay, level of dependence should not determine someone's value. Level of development should not determine someone's value. The size of a person should not determine their value. What about location? Should location determine someone's value? Whether they're here and could live outside of the womb, either way, they're valuable. Let me ask a question. Where do rights come from? Rights come from God. We don't get our rights from the Declaration of Independence or any other document. The Declaration of Independence simply acknowledges that they are already given by God and should be defended. <clears throat> All right, now I'm going to jump ahead. By the way, if you were going to 
justify enslaving or killing a percentage of a population, you would have to dehumanize them. If you dehumanize a population, that's justification for means to do that. Um, Hitler is a good example of this. Put that picture. Hitler said this, the Jews are undoubtedly a race, but they are not human. <clears throat> this is how they justified killing Jews. All right. How can we make a stand for life? I want to encourage you to make a stand for life. I'm going to give you five ways today. Number one, prayer, supplication. If my people who are called by, by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen? Prayer, prayer, prayer. Do it, do it, do it. Number two, so supplication. Number two, consideration. This is probably an area that the church needs to be better in. We as believers should not be known just for just what we are against. We need to be known what we are for. Okay? We're not just standing against things. We're standing for things. And we need to have tremendous consideration for mothers who are at risk. And listen, what is, imagine being a teenager, 16, 17, 18 years old, in a relationship, pregnant, or maybe not in a relationship. That's a scary place to be. We need to have empathy, compassion, consideration for them. If we want to tell women they should keep their babies, do we lift a finger to help them keep their babies? Okay? You know, Jesus talked about the Pharisees. Matthew 24, I believe it is. And he was, woe to you, you hypocrites. And he, and he laid down, man, it was ugly. <laughs> One thing he said is, he says, um, you tie heavy loads on people, but you yourselves don't lift a finger to help them. Okay? If we're going to encumber people with a heavy burden, you should keep this baby, you should raise baby. We as a church need to be able to come alongside people and help them in any way we can. And then, number three, how can we make a stand for life? Number three is education. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. This is one of the reasons why young people teach them abstinence training, why that is better. One of the reasons why we have so many at-risk mothers is because we have a promiscuity problem in our nation. We wouldn't have such an um, unwanted pregnancy problem if we, didn't, if we had a culture that valued sexual purity. The other side of education is what m many people don't know what they would experience after an abortion, which is regret and guilt and other re repercussions. So education is important. Supplication, consideration, education. Number four, legislation. This is one that we typically major on as, as Christians and we should um, care. And it's not the only thing we should care about. But I, this is, by the way, what I'm about to say is all new. I've never said this from the Pope before. I think it's good. In case you're in the camp where you think the United States has reasonable abortion laws, I want to ask you a question. Did you know that there are only six nations in the world that allow abortion on demand through nine months of pregnancy? Six nations. The United States is one of them. Around the globe, 77 nations outlaw abortion completely or only allow abortion where a woman's physical health is at risk. 77. More surprisingly, 94% of countries around the world, that's 186 countries, have national restrictions on abortion in the second trimester. 56 countries, including 48 of the 51 European countries, ban abortion after 14 weeks. Okay. The United States is... Um, not normal in that respect. So which countries allow abortion on demand through nine months? Among the six countries, um, among those six countries are guilty of placing religious minorities in consecration camps, starving their own people, imprisoning political opponents, and offering people with disabilities an option for assisted suicide, but not for care. Who are they? Number one, North Korea. Number two, China. Number, two, uh, number three, Vietnam, South Korea, Canada, United States. Now, when you're a country and you uniquely find yourself on the same list as North Korea, China, and Vietnam, countries that have gross human, vi uh, human rights uh, violations, you might be on the wrong track, right? You might be on the wrong track. Our abortion laws, if you think they're reasonable, they are considered extreme and rare 
by the rest of the world's standards, and that's saying a lot in a world that doesn't follow Jesus. So, having some sensibility in this case um, would go a long way. How can we make a stand for life? Supplication, consideration, education, legislation, legislation. Number five, the last one, proclamation. We need to be a voice for the most voiceless there are. I want to conclude this message. Hopefully we can do this in not too much time. I want to conclude this message by inviting you into a prophetic process that I had with the Lord. How many of you know that sometimes... Um, you're in life and you see that there something happens in the world and you automatically know this oh this is let's watch this is a big event this is a significant event how many know what I'm talking about other times something happens and you're like this isn't um, overtly significant but I know there's something something underneath this is happening and I just have a feeling about what's happening here I'm, I'm going to tell you you just have your your cylinders going off um so many times we've been in situations where something massively important happens. Um, I'm going to say a date, and almost 100% of you will know what I'm talking about. You'll know what happened that day. Uh, September 11th, 2001. How many, how many know what happened that day? How many? Even if you weren't alive, do you know what happened that day? Okay. Do you remember right where you were? I remember exactly where I was. I knew exactly what I was doing. I was a military-aged man. During that time, I was, I almost enlisted because I had such a heart to defend this nation. I remember when the United States invaded Afghanistan, Iraq. I remember exactly where I was. Uh, let me give you a couple of more dates, perhaps more obscure, but some of you will know what they are. Um, November 9th, 1989. Does anyone know what happened that day? Boom, you got it, honey. The Berlin Wall. Did you look at my notes? Okay. Right. School. By the way, I was like, I left the house today on the way to church, and I realized I left all my notes at home. I turn around and go back and get them, so I was a little late. Yeah, Berlin Wall, 1989, November 9th. How about this one? January 28th, 1986. So, um, recognize that date. Say it? Challenger Space Shuttle, yes, sir. That's the uh, Challenger disaster. Oh, how about this one? July 16th, 1969. Boom, land on the moon, Apollo 11, land on the moon. Okay, those are overtly obvious significant events. I want to I want to highlight a, a more subtle event that happened, but it had massive consequences um, in our world, okay? This event happened September 18th, 2020. I watched an event unfold. I knew it was significant, but prophetically I knew... It had more significance underneath. On the, in fact, on the surface, everyone knew it was significant, but ultimately it led to the cause of the sanctity of life cause being advanced. This is, this is what I'm going to do. In a minute, I'm gonna, I don't want to set this up a little bit. In a minute, I want to play a video. And the video is the moment, um, the day Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, and it's the moment that President Trump learned that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. He had been campaigning all day, and then he was getting back on Air Force One and found out that she had died. So, obviously, overtly, on the surface, the death of a Supreme Court justice is big news. That's big news, no matter, you know. Underneath that, covertly, I knew it was significant because it would lead to the tilting of the Supreme Court to... Um, in a more pro-life direction. For those of you who don't know, the, the sitting president um, appoints Supreme Court justices, and Supreme uh, Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was not pro-life, and we knew, of course, that uh, President Trump would appoint pro-life Supreme Court justices. Now, before I play this video, I just want to say, I in no way, and, and nor should we ever, gloat over someone's death, because we're pro-life. Right? Even even when I hear of terrorists being killed in other countries, I don't. That makes me sad. I'm sad that they had to die. I'm sad that they had to be taken out. Um, so even we should never gloat over over someone's death. Um, in many respects, Ruth Bader Ginsburg did many great things. 
in, in the terms of the, the pro-life movement, she was not pro-life. And I knew that I understood the gravity of the situation, both obviously, but also prophetically, I, be, I believe the Lord was doing something that was going to pan out. One of the things I want you to notice about this video that we're about to play, and this was the, the prophetic moment for me, was what I want you to notice is there's a, a song playing in the background. And I believe this song, it's not a Christian song, but this song was making a prophetic declaration about what the Lord was up to and what the Lord was doing. So without further ado, go and watch that video. Just died. Wow. I didn't know that. I just, uh, you're telling me now for the first time. She led an amazing life. What else can you say? She was an amazing woman. Whether you agreed or not, she was an amazing woman who led an amazing life. I'm actually sad to hear that. I am sad to hear that. Thank you very much. Now, I already explained why that is overtly significant, the death of a Supreme Court justice. Another president would be nominating a Supreme Court justice. Obviously, that's big news. What struck me about this moment, and I haven't been able to move past this for, for uh, four years, is that the song in the background, it came on just as Trump was walking up. There was another song they were playing. Just as he walked up, there was a song by Elton John, ooh boy, called Tiny Dancer. And I felt the Lord speak to my heart when I heard this. The Lord said to me, remember the tiny dancers who know we ought to dance on earth. Remember the tiny dancers. I'm about to defend those who couldn't defend themselves. The Lord was declaring these lyrics to me. Ballerina, you must have seen her dancing in the sand. And now she's in me, always with me, tiny dancer in my hand. The Lord is about to shift the tide of the Supreme Court. For me, it was a prophetic moment to remember to stand up for those who cannot stand for themselves. Proverbs 31.8 says, Open your mouth for the speeches and the cause of all who are appointed to die. I have a picture here of my little baby daughter. She's 13 now, and she was much little, a tiny dancer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a father of daughters, so I have a soft, spark, a soft heart for little girls. But my question, what I felt the Lord saying is how many tiny dancers never got to dance on this earth? because of the Roe Wade decision that happened in 1973. Trump would go on to appoint Amy Coney Barrett to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, tilting the court in a pro-life direction, which ultimately led to the overturning of the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973, or as I like to call it, the death decree of 73. The Roe decision back then made abortion on demand available in all 50 states, and in many states that meant no restrictions. Interestingly, also, the song Tiny Dancer was released in 1971, the same time the Roe Wade battle was happening in the courts. Church, I want to encourage you to be like the early church, be like the early Christians who stood up for the tiny dancers. Stand up for the tiny dancers who never got to dance and make a stand so that more tiny dancers can dance on earth and have a chance to live their life that God has called them to. Why? They have value. They have purpose. They are human. They should have rights. Amen. How do you make a stand for life? Supplication, consideration, education, legislation, proclamation, promoting adoption, helping mothers who are at risk, get a girl pregnant, take care of her. Amen. Don't be promiscuous. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We come before you. We thank you that that decision of 1973 was overturned. But Lord, I know that the battle rages on in, in 
in many cases, we still have the most loose and open abortion laws in the world. Lord, I just pray for the, the church that we wouldn't say, oh, we won that battle and we would stop fighting. God, I say that we would continue to rise up, continue to stand. Lord, for the tiny dancers, we continue to stand. For little boys, for little girls, Lord God, to be born into this world. God, we, as a nation, God, I just say, we repent for not allowing life. We repent for not knowing what we're doing, Lord. And I thank you for your love and forgiveness and your mercy to come alongside us and to flood us with compassion.